Okay. We're back. <laughs> we are back. We uh, got some what? <laughs> got some food in our bellies. Got some coffee for an afternoon pick me up. We normally don't do coffee in the afternoon. We really didn't drink very much coffee this morning. We only True. had like a quarter of our cups. It just didn't taste good. Uh, just wasn't popping. Wasn't popping. So. so we are continuing on cutting the floors. Yep. Um, uh, dealing with bees. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it's just us. I wonder if it's um. Don't forget your ear pro, eye pro, hand pro. Yeah. Pro pro. Pro pro. <laughs> Joe pro pro. Right, right. Um. All right. Okay. Let's carry on my wayward. We opted to put in a subfloor to ensure that the vinyl planking we wanted to use had a solid foundation to be installed on. We used 5 8 inch thick particle board and only needed to take one foot off the length since our trailer is 7 feet wide. We were initially going to use regular plywood, but the price was way too expensive and with us being on a tight budget, we decided that the particle board would suffice for both its purpose and our bank account. On the second panel we put in, we noticed what could have been a really big problem had we not been able to fix it. Since we're working with a cargo trailer that isn't technically meant to be lived in and isn't built to the same specifications as an RV, the original flooring was a little uneven, which caused one section of insulation and our subflooring to sit roughly an eighth of an inch higher than the other panel. To overcome this obstacle, James tamped down the insulation with a rubber mallet so the plywood flooring would be the same level. Adapt and overcome. That is what we do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, definitely don't think I was expecting so many hiccups yeah hiccups um obstacles to overcome you know like that's the name of the game i guess is how well can you overcome the obstacles that you are sure to face you know that there's no video there's not enough videos out there that really can prepare you for whatever slight hiccups you might experience like, little things like that that can really throw something completely off and you have to find a way around it, you have to find a way to deal with it, um, or your only other option is to give up and that's not an option. It's definitely not an option. So, Stop fighting, that's death. Yeah. We had some uh, stuff to return. We have an extra sheet of plywood, or, uh, insulation, two inch thick, that we didn't need to use. We over calculated. So thank goodness for Home Depot's return policy. Yeah. Get some longer screws, hopefully the longer screws paired with um, the fact that we just, you just hammered down some of the foam. Um, hopefully that will solve our eighth of an inch floor difference uh, that we've got going. But that's, that's an atomic problem right there. Meaning it's so minuscule, but it's so big on its yeah, scale I mean, of Literally no that. flooring could go in, nothing could go in properly because no, no, no. about that. Alrighty. Well, we'll come back at you after our forty second home depot trip today. Day forty two. Alrighty. Alright, see you in a bit. Instead of repeating the measurement geometry all over again, James took the insulation pieces from the venos of the trailer and simply traced them out onto the particle board to get the same shape. Icing on the cake. Come on. There we go. Oh, that's so nice. Look at that, baby love. We got a floor. 
Once all the subfloor was laid down, it was time for James to drill everything into place permanently. Let's jump back here. Start drilling some screws down. We used three inch screws to sandwich the insulation panel between the sheets of wood. We also countersunk the screws to ensure they would penetrate deep enough into the original flooring. James went on to install the ceiling insulation, and right after that, we went on a forced two-week hiatus. Okay, so full honesty, we had two weeks of being at an absolute standstill. We couldn't move forward without running the wiring. We had literally no idea what to do. In our opinion, running the electrical was the single most intimidating part of this entire build. We watched videos of people's wires burning up because they overloaded them and didn't run things correctly. So we were horrified, nervous, and so scared that we made a huge mistake thinking we could do this conversion by ourselves. So instead of giving up, we spent two weeks straight learning what we needed to learn in order to run the electrical safely and correctly. Because we found very little resources on how to run electrical for a cargo trailer, we wanted to dedicate an entire video just to our electrical setup. So we won't be covering it in this episode, but we will be creating an entire episode dedicated to it so we can spend the proper time it'll take to explain it the best way we can. All right, everybody. So today we have uh, decided to go to Home Depot and get some more furring strips. So what we're going to do is we're going to just put those furring strips vertically on all of the uh, frame tubes and just extend it out a little bit more so that we have a, another little buffer room of space between the insulation and where the wall is going to go for those wires to sit because some of those 10, three wires are a little difficult to maneuver and we just want to make sure we give ample amount of room. It's only going to take about an inch and a half maybe at most uh, from our interior width, but we think it's well worth it. <laughs> So 79 for interior height, 77 for interior width. All right, let's go ahead and head back into the shop. Like James said, some of those thicker 10-3 wires we ran for our AC electrical were a little difficult to position, and we wanted to ensure the wires never got too hot and didn't get worn down and exposed because of friction. So we bought 45 more furring strips to give the wiring that we ran for our electrical a little buffer room to breathe. Deciding to do a second round of furring strips was totally not accounted for in our budget. At the time we purchased them, furring strips were about $2.20. That created an unplanned $100 ding to our budget that we had to figure out how to deal with. But these are the type of obstacles we ran into throughout the entire build and had to find ways to overcome, because giving up just wasn't an option. Once the furring strips were installed, it was time for our Max Air Fan installation. This was the first hole we would cut into our trailer, so it was a momentous occasion for us. James started out by measuring where we wanted the fan to go. Since the spacing between the ceiling frame was 24 inches on center, we had to build a frame that would house the 14 inch fan between the 24 inch gap of the steel beams. James used 2 by 2s and pocket screwed them together using the Craig pocket hole jig. That thing became an absolute lifesaver and necessity for the remainder of the build. Using the pocket hole jig ensured the sturdiness and durability of all of our framing.
like a glove. We trace out the frame onto the insulation and got to work cutting that piece out. So I was tasked with cutting out the insulation for the Max Air fan. I did give it my all, but because I don't have shoulders of steel, James did have to finish it up for me. Our next step was to drill four pilot holes in each corner so that we had a reference point of where to measure and cut from on top of the roof. James lived by the adage, measure 20 times, cut once, throughout the build. We spent a good 20 to 30 minutes perfecting our measurements to ensure we did this right the first time. You only get one shot to cut a hole in your roof. To make sure the outline was perfectly square, we remeasured off of one hole and redrilled what would be our final corners. These holes gave us a starting point to begin cutting with the Ryobi oscillating tool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the corners and work my way out on all four. And I think what I'll have you do is I'll switch the blade and I'll have you just finish cutting out the rest. <laughs> she nodded yes. No, I did. She said yes. <laughs> I went to Ryobi. She said yes. <laughs> That's a good one. Alright, you good. ready? <laughs> <laughs> just the nerves, I think I could put this against. Alright, let's wow. just alright. Should we say like a here let's pray? Dear Lord. Please allow us to cut straight and not <laughs> this out. <laughs> Please, seriously, God, don't let seriously, us uh, mess don't this up. Let us mess this up. <laughs> Alright, ready? Are you ready? Are I'm you, ready. This is it, right? <laughs> this is it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't mind the Hold beads on, of sweat don't. dripping. I, uh, you're sure. I mean. We're sure. Are you sure? I'm sure. It's a really tight tolerance between any mistakes, so that, that's a good thing. Yeah. So we know the way we're using the oscillating tool in some shots might look weird. Yes, we do know the proper way to cut with the oscillating tool, but when we were cutting the aluminum, the teeth of the blade kept catching on the aluminum, causing the tool to jump off track a little. We found that using the blade the way we did was not only easier, but it helped keep the tool on track and the cut straight. We got a big hole in our roof. Wow. All right. Well, okay. Now what we gotta do is we gotta go uh, see if the fan fits.
my job right now to cut out these pieces for the wood frame insulation. Uh, James took the knife to tease this because it's the only thing here. <laughs> but it works just the same. This is the moment James realized we messed up. Okay, seriously though, as James went to drill pilot holes to countersink the wood to metal self-tapping screws, he quickly realized he couldn't do anything at the angle he was at. So we took out the fan really quick, removed the pocket screws from the inner 2x2s, and then we were able to use the impact drill to secure the wood frame to the steel frame. Alrighty, next was our butyl tape. Don't forget this step guys, do everything it takes to avoid water intrusion and mold problems. We ended up doing a double layer of butyl tape before finally seating the fan in place and pushing down on it firmly to spread the butyl tape. Then we drilled the screws in. And we're also gonna be doing this like the bolt pattern okay on a tire on a rim and tire uh, where we go opposites and the reason why we do that is so that it can evenly squeeze out so that we're not like tightening up on the inside from the outside because if you screw these ones down and then screw these ones down and then this one it could actually create like a bow in the middle so you want to make sure you do your four corners first then you do inside and inside center okay and then kind of work your way outside Just okay like a little cross pattern so here we go we will get the we ended up choosing a max air max fan it has a powered lift a 12 volt fan with a remote that doubles as a thermostat and it also has 10 fan speeds but what ultimately sold us on this model was the rain sensor. The sensor automatically closes the roof vent and shuts off the fan to prevent the interior of your RV, trailer, or van from getting wet. This was a huge bonus in case we're on a hike, in the grocery store, or taking an afternoon siesta and can't close the roof vent in time before rain or snow. Once all screws were in place, it was time for lap sealant. We literally used an entire bottle for the fan installation. Again, one of the times where you can't have too much. With the fan installed, we just had to test it out. We used our 12 volt vehicle battery jump pack to supply the power to at least ensure the fan worked. Do note that on the Max Air fan, the positive wire was black and is clearly marked positive, so don't depend on the wire color alone. But we simply hooked up the positive and negative wires to the jumper pack and turned it on. <laughs> oh, we got power. 
All right, little insulation pieces just went in. Fan is officially done. And then. Nice. Good job, baby. Nice job. Me too. I'm proud of you. Avino's trailer is a little different. In order to secure the ceiling material in the corner, James had to create a makeshift ceiling stud. He took a scrap 1x2 furring strip, cut it to the angle of the nose, and drilled pilot holes to countersink the screws, and then fastened it to the studs in the corner. You will see later in this episode when we install the ceiling where this piece comes into play. All right, we are going to open this Ryobi Brad Nailer. Okay. This is an 18 volt. We got, um, we're doing a lot, all 18 volt, right? Because it's yeah, all interchangeable. We have two batteries. It's the Ryobi One system. Yes. One battery. Meaning one battery. <laughs> it's freaking awesome, honestly. Uh, no compressor needed. This can fit up to two inch Brad Nails. What else? I'm missing the best part. And we ended up getting five eighths uh, brad nails because I don't think that we need anything bigger than that uh, to go through the uh, underlayment ceiling. So what I'm going to have to do real quick is take a crash course on this specific operator's manual. Okay, so we love the brand nailers. Yeah. Battery is not in. But the Brad Nailer. Okay, hmm. so that's locked in place. That's ready to rock and roll. Did it just die? Nope, didn't die. Didn't die. That was scary. Let's see if we take this out. Turn the pressure down. A wee bit. All the way down. That shot in there pretty and then we just significantly. Okay. okay. Wow. So that's pretty much So, we are ready. In episode one, we were caught off guard and extremely bummed when we found out we couldn't use the original manufacturer plywood walls as our walling option. But as always, everything was meant to be because we ended up finding a beautiful ceiling and walling option that we actually just brad nailed right on top of the original plywood walls. We used a five millimeter wood underlayment panel. It came in four by eight sheets, and it was not only the cheapest option at $25 per sheet, but it had the prettiest sheen to it, and it was incredibly smooth. We knew we didn't have to take the time to sand everything, and that the paint would sit nicely over it. We started with our ceiling and cut out the holes for our puck lights. We're using a two and a quarter inch Diablo hole saw. Once the hole was drilled, I took the Dremel tool and sanded down the rough edges so the light would fit perfectly.
looks great to me. Yeah. Left our wires sticking out for our bug lights. Our what the bug lights? What the bug lights. Brad nailed it in. And we've got more of a gap on this side than on that side uh, where it ends on that wall, but it's all going to be covered by plywood and trim anyway, so don't matter. Don't matter. on this stuff. Right. Um, what I can do is I can actually... You okay? <laughs> hey, yeah! Oh, watch out. Um, what I can do is I can actually... So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and measure... We're doing the Ferguson strips right um, now. Yeah, we might have to uh, because... So 14... On both of those. So... Two furring strips at 14 and a quarter and two at 17 and a quarter. Done. Done. We're gonna go cut some furring strips. Oh. Due to our budget being so tight, we were going to try to get away with not purchasing a skill saw, table saw, miter saw, etc. However, the universe had other plans for us, likely foreseeing how difficult it would have been not having said tools. Enter our unsuspecting neighbor turned friend, Nick. He just so happened to have some extra knowledge and tools we desperately needed to make this build easier and quicker, so you'll be seeing him throughout future episodes. Shout out to you, man! The tool I'm using is a circular saw with a Craig rip cut saw guide and made cutting so much easier than using a piece of wood and C clamps as our guide. As I'm sure you guys have seen by now, we are big Ryobi fans. We're not sponsored in any way, although we would love to be for a future build. We're just real consumers who were on a budget that Ryobi could accommodate, and we were genuinely impressed by the quality of every tool we purchased. This footage is about a year old, so some of the tools already have newer, more improved models out today, but ours definitely show no sign of needing to be replaced, so it might be a while before we can test those newer ones out. We just wanted to be transparent with the tools we used as well as give Ryobi a true shout out because these tools are solid and for the competitive price, we were impressed. almost got the entire ceiling completed, but we ended the day and finished the corner pieces the next morning.
Finished ceiling, baby love. Look at that. That doesn't look too bad. It doesn't. Not too shambly, shall I say. Like, I love that it's just not perfect. You know what I mean? Okay. It just it shows that we've done it. I need it. And we've got a full ceiling. Thanks for watching Build Episode 2. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss our future episodes.